I swear, if just one more person says to me, oh, well, you know, what about rosemary? You grow rosemary. It's impossible to kill. I've killed three rosemary bushes. Let's meet some people who are going to help us grow our own. Piers Warren is an author and wildlife filmmaker living in rural Norfolk. Amongst his books, he's produced The Vegan Cook and Gardener, along with his daughter, Ella B. Glendinning. Is it Glendinning or Glendining? Glendinning. Glendinning. Should have stuck with it. Well done. (laughs) He also writes a regular Grow Your Own page in Vegan Life magazine. Piers has grown veganically for many years and encourages other people to grow their own food in the most ethical, healthy and planet-friendly way. I have so many questions. Jack Hodgson is the owner of Jack's Patch. He runs a market garden, run off regenerative practices such as no-dig and permaculture. Again, so many questions, which focus on soil health and making the garden an ecosystem so life within the garden thrives. He also has an urban farming project where he converted a 20-foot shipping container into a mushroom and microgreen production area. Sounds like my fridge. And Mitch McCulloch is a regenerative and organic no-dig grower, plus he's the co-creator of Pomona Films, which tells stories by focusing on regenerative solutions, the natural world and inspirational people. Gentlemen, all of you, welcome... Listeners have no idea just how punishing it's been uh, to get this podcast recorded, um, but we're here now, and thank you um, sincerely. Uh, this being our second attempt at it, and a painful one at that. Um, I've got so many questions. I suck at gardening. I was once told uh, by someone that uh, a gardener. He said it's basically a process of controlled neglect. Uh, I'm applying that to child rearing too. But w- would you agree that that's that's what it is, Piers. Yes, and that applies particularly to veganic gardening. I remember years ago I did a vegan permaculture course in Somerset, which was on a veganic small holding. And at the time, I remember being a bit confused that it appeared to be overrun with weeds and what a lot of people might call uncared for. But actually, it was it was carefully left that way because the worst thing you can do to soil is leave it bare all the nutrients then just get washed out by the weather and so even weeds growing on soil is better than leaving it bare for the health of the soil amazing um jack what's the secret of gardening for you oh well i think nature brings it back so nature we are nature um, and we are stewards of the land. We just need to go back to it. For, for me, it gives me a lot of peace. It's really good for your mental health. But when, when I'm there, I'm observing the land a lot more. And that's very, uh, this is like what permaculture is. And you just start to read the land a little bit better, but you're c- constantly creating an ecosystem. And you start seeing things come back. It's like magic. You put something in place like uh, a pond, and then all of a sudden, newts, frogs, um, wildlife turns up, and it, it's really beautiful. Um, Brilliant! It sounds like uh, listing a party on Facebook. Uh, Mitch, what's what what's the essence of gardening for you? Uh, it's food. It all comes down to food for me. Um, was a chef in my previous life, and that's what's motivated me to to create a kitchen garden, healthy, organic food, which is good for the environment and good for me fantastic well we've had lots of questions uh people are really excited including one topic which i'm gonna say you you don't want to be eating when we get onto it but i am so excited to talk about it it's i'm absolutely obsessed but we'll, we'll come on to it um why don't we start with Emma's question? She says, hi, I love the podcast. Great show, Steve. Thanks, Emma. Uh, question, what can I do to keep potted herbs alive? Oh, yeah. Now that's the holy grail. <laughs> um, Mitch, let's start with you. Keep potted herbs alive. Hmm. Uh, things like mint you could chop down now at the beginning of uh, winter to promote healthy growth. Um, I think as well, contrary to what people think, herbs actually like rich organic soil. Um, people believe that herbs like uh, this depleted soil with no nutrients. But yeah, that's what I, I heard. I disagree. Oh, okay. So 
say you buy a, a pot of basil from your supermarket. What should you do? Because I just watch it slowly die. I think the it's like my, why... my, my windowsill is a hospice. Perhaps. <laughs> If you were to thin those uh, basil plants out of the pot and and uh, spread them out over a few more pots, you definitely would see some vigorous growth in there and you wouldn't kill them. Okay, excellent. Jack, what are your top tips for keeping herbs alive? Well, uh, just kind of uh, beginning up what Mitch said. So when you get them, if you lift them out of the pot, they're going to be super root bound as well. They've overseeded it. Um, and I've, you see them with expiry dates as well, which is quite funny, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it wants to live on. It just needs to be potted in like a bigger pot. I, I've done it at the farm actually, like as a experiment. Uh, but if you just put it in a bigger pot, uh, you break the roots up and I've, I've split stuff as well. So you just get your thumb in the middle of that pot and you break through the middle and you can split it into like quarters repot i mean as long as you just make sure that soil's moist that it goes in so the roots take root um yeah you're gonna have a bit more luck um but yeah that, that, i always see those guys at like 10p in the supermarket looking all wilted and i'm like i'm gonna save you yeah 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 <laughs> so i see it as a little mission to save them i feel sorry for them and all they want is a little bit of yeah. love it's a funny thing, you know, that, that you're you, one of the great things you always get as a vegan is like, oh, what about onions? Oh, you murder onions and stuff. But it's true that I do feel compassion for plants too sometimes. And um, you should. That's a good observation that. Piers, uh, how, how can we save herbs? Well, I mean, we've been talking about buying basil ready grown in a pot from a supermarket. And of course, that's OK if it's an emergency. But rather than do that, I would suggest you buy yourself a packet of basil seeds and do it yourself from scratch and you'll grow thousands of plants for a fraction of the price. And you can plant a few every week so you get this successional delivery of lovely fresh basil leaves. And in general, when we're thinking about herbs, a lot of them are, of course, Mediterranean, all the classics like sage and thyme and oregano, which is probably my favorite. They will grow in this country perfectly fine. But remember, they like heat and they like sun and they like good drainage. Mitch was saying earlier about how people tend to think they, they like rubbish soil or they'll grow in rock and gravel. And it, as he says, it's not the case. It's just that they need drainage and people confuse drainage, poor nutrients, and they don't have to go hand in hand. So if you are potting up some herbs, use a lot of grit in with the really nutritious compost. So they have both nutrition and good drainage. And if they are in, in pots, as has been suggested, then put them in the sunniest place you can find. And if it's this time of year, either in a conservatory um, or on a windowsill, which gets low sun. Brilliant. Just, yeah. Uh, ju yeah, I just want to add one more thing. The, the extra bit of fun with a lot of herbs is um, where they cut come again, so you can pinch out the tops and they're going to send out a side shoot. So basil, for example, is one of them. So if you take a pinch above uh, a node, then you'll see like two in between the stem and the leaf, there's always uh, another bit of growth. If you pinch it out, it'll get bushier. Right. And then you can take that pinched bit out, put that in water, and that will grow another plant. So that no. will that'll get that will root. Um, but it's a fun little experiment as well. I do it all the time on Instagram with mint, sage, and I just say pinch it out. The, the plant's actually going to get bushier, so you're going to get more food. And then you just you've propagate it by putting that in water. That will root after a week or two weeks and then mm. repot that. And then you just multiply and plants. But yeah. you, you, you're never going to get better than, at, than uh, as Piers said, starting from seed, organic, get a nice fresh growth. Uh, that's probably the best way. But you can just multiply. And is that a, a thing like those kind of supermarket herbs and stuff? Is it um, that they don't seem to be very hardy? Like they're great, but they seem to sort of just uh, fall over in a kind well, of. Well, that's uh. that's that's partly just because, as has been mentioned, they put far too many seeds into one pot, right. so they grow really quickly, uh, really tall and fast. They're in great competition with each other, 
for the gotcha. small amount of nutrients in a tiny little pot. So yes, they are weak and they need to be thinned out as uh, Jack said earlier. Perfect. Emma, you can do this. Um, I'm going to save Dave's question. Becca says, uh, hi, I'm loving the podcast. Oh my God, so much love. Thank you. And I enjoy cooking recipes that are mentioned on it. My favorite so far has been Tim Anderson's katsu burger with the deep fried cheese for crunch. Oh God, it was so delicious. Oh man. I think that was in the uh, Japan episode. If you want to go and dig that one out. My question this week is, I'd love to know what the panel's favorite autumnal dish to cook is. Mitch, why don't we start with you? uh autumnal dish it has to be one thing for me it's mushrooms um just wild forage mushrooms at this time of year is yeah it's mind-blowing if you know what you're doing if otherwise you know what you're doing yeah. you're in hospital with your stomach being pumped and yeah yeah um <laughs> from the garden there's a lot of a lot of nice root vegetables coming up at the moment celeriac i harvested and swede so yeah something with that stew maybe yeah yeah sounds good embracing the root vegetables i find uh, you know they can be a bit i don't want to say dull but really well nah they're far far from it if you know how to cook them then they're like elite there it's an elite food <laughs> elite okay well how what would you what would you do with a a, a swede and a celeriac well to be honest uh mitch is the chef i i would love to it, he's the man for cooking for sure sure uh, for, for me like celeriac when i give it to chefs and they give it back to me and so i'll oh, try that try that so uh celeriac i've had three ways so they uh, the whole dish was celeriac and it was pureed it was diced in certain ways it was pickled and yeah, you could do amazing stuff with it. It's more about the manipulation of plants. People just see, oh, that's a celeriac. What do I do with yeah. that? But the manipulation of celeriac or cauliflower, like we we know like the recipes of like cauliflower wings these days and all that mm. sort of stuff. And like, oh, God, it tastes like chicken wings. Um, so it's about the manipulation. I think Mitch is the man to ask for food uh, because – Sure. He's a quality, quality chef and does awesome recipes on Instagram. But yeah, for me, it's this time of year, mushrooms, pumpkin, root veg. Um, and, and weirdly as well, as we go into winter, uh, salad, salady bits like pak choy, rocket mustard. These things come into a peak level of taste because these got like a natural antifreeze in them. So the sugars change and they get sweeter. Um, and, and like, so you wouldn't go to eat salad in the winter, hmm. um, but it actually tastes better if you get it from a grower, uh, nice. like if you go get in the garden. So I'm a big pusher of like eating more greens yeah. in, the, in the winter. Well, who doesn't enjoy a glass of antifreeze this time of year? Um, <laughs> Mitch, what are your top tips for a stew? Because I suck at stews is I think probably what we're concluding. Uh, for stews, hmm, I usually like to make like a sort of uh, caram, you know, French onion soup. So you caramelize mm -hmm. your onions down. That's a good base of any stew. You get a lot of sweetness yeah. out of that. But for cooking celeriac, my favorite way would be to salt bake it. So make like a pastry with lots of salt, wrap it up, bake it whole. And that's really good for like um, using as a centerpiece for a roast dinner on a Sunday. That sounds awesome. I, I tried salt baking for the first time last year and yeah, it's, it is awesome. Yeah, um, the amount of depth of flavor you can achieve is just, yeah, mind blowing. Yeah. Plus it's really salty and who doesn't love that? I remember when I first went vegan 10 years ago, I was like, salt is one of the two vegan flavors. The other one is sweet. Uh, but I obviously, I don't mean that now. It's all changed now. I've, I've, I've grown up a bit, a bit. Um, Piers, what do you like to cook this time of year? tell you what this autumn i've completely fallen in love with pumpkin again which a lot of people think of as being pretty bland this orange flesh that doesn't taste of very much uh, i make a lot of soup with it and i i tend to prefer to grow the smaller pumpkins either by their variety or by adding a higher number of pumpkin fruits grow on the same plant so rather than end up with an enormous one which is fine for making lanterns but the, then you end up with kilograms of flesh and you don't know what to do with it unfortunately a lot of people just throw it away which is a crime Certainly. so what i do is I, I grow the smaller ones where one pumpkin fruit is enough for a meal for two people so soups are great and of course it's all about what you add to the flesh that flavor and uh, umami taste um but my favorite autumn dish at the moment 
is a pumpkin and mushroom risotto. And the key thing is I start by cutting the pumpkin flesh into tiny cubes, something about one centimetre cubed, and then either fry them in oil, or bake them in oil in the oven until they're uh, really kind of caramelised and getting a bit crunchy. And make your risotto in the normal way. You start with your onion and garlic and put the rice in, uh, maybe a glass of wine, um, and then build it up with the stock. And then about five minutes before the end, before the rice has finished cooking, then you tumble in the uh, pumpkin cubes. And nice. addition, additionally, you can put in chestnut mushrooms or even sweet chestnuts themselves, and it makes a really delicious autumnal risotto. That sounds great. Um, that was a great question, Becca. Thanks very much. Uh, love an open question. Um, Alan and Kathy say, what can we do with our pears? We've bought a new house and we have a pear and apple tree in the garden. I must admit, I'm not a huge pear fan, but I also don't want them to go to waste. I love pears. Uh, I feel they're a much underappreciated fruit. Um, Piers, what do you like to do with pears? Well, I completely understand the problem because in a previous house, I had three pear trees, which were all wow. very productive. And so I always had far more pears than I knew what to do with. The thing I fell back on is the juice. So I I have a fruit pulp juicer or you can you can buy them or you can borrow them so you just uh, chunk up the pears put it in the juicer squeeze it out and it's unbelievably sweet and tasty when you drink it straight away if you put it into some sort of container keep it refrigerated and it will last for a few days if you keep it any longer than that, it will start to ferment even in a fridge. So if you yeah. want to keep it longer than that as juice, just stick the containers in the freezer. Uh, but if you do want to ferment it, of course, you can make spark perry, perry with it. So put it in a demijohn, a bit of uh, brewer's yeast, and it's essentially the same process as making cider. And it's delicious literally controlled neglect again just just leave it <laughs> leave it in a vat until it's fizzy. yeah 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 <laughs> um jack what do you do with pears to be honest i'm not i'm not a great cook so i'm actually listening here I, sure. I'm, a, I'm a i'm an i'm a viewer at the minute listening to that i've just picked <laughs> up some free demijohn so i'm i'm really interested by that um yeah. but yeah I, I mean in the garden when they're when they're there fresh i think pears are pretty underrated actually i agree um, I got to ask you because I, I I have a pear tree and um and I've got an apple tree as well. Now, is it a thing with apple and pear trees that they kind of overfruit, and you have to kind of or like they can actually sort of harm themselves by overproducing fruit? I heard about a thing called the June drop where you, you should shake them in June to kind of winnow out all the the weaker pears that may not survive. Is is that a thing, Jack? Oh. You, you tell me. I, <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, I'll, I'll pass this one over because I don't have. I've actually never grown. I've not got any fruit trees on the plot because my plot's quite small. Um, but we have. Like, the, there is apples and stuff over the back, and the last two seasons because of the late frost we've had, we've lost pretty much all of them. Um, but I, I'm quite interested by this myself. If I'll just pass it over on this one. Yeah, go scrumping. Um, and Mitch, what about you? What do you do with pears? Uh, some more controlled neglect. Um, I would make a sourdough cake with them. So you get your pears, chop them up, sourdough starter, flour, sugar, maybe some raisins or sultanas, and just let that all ferment. And then once that's been 12 hours in there, we bake it in the oven till it's sort of like a stodgy cons consistency. And when that one cools second, down, sorry. Keep going. Sorry. And when that cools down, you can get a really nice slice somewhere in between bread and butter pudding and and a and a cake. That sounds fantastic. Someone is really insistent at my front door. I am so sorry. Forgive me. Okay, no problem. <clears throat> Hello. Sorry. I don't deal with fruit. Yeah. <laughs> 
It's such it's a shame because my plot. <laughs> uh, it's just my plot's too small to have the trees. I've got. Well, I've just got thirty cuttings of fig. Trees. Okay, this one might go down as the worst Mitch. podcast. What? What? Everybody, all right? Where's Pierce gone? Yeah, I'm here. I'll be with you. In a sec. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, this is a great podcast so far, despite everything uh, working against it. <laughs> God damn it, we will get through this. Um, I basically, I basically, when 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 we pick up the, the thing, I really want to talk about is um, vegetable growing. No, it's manure, it's, isn't it? It, yeah, yeah, it's it's poo. Your... I want to talk about poo. I have a, I have a lot of pet theories. Um, so yeah, uh, I I find it fascinating. Um, what manure? Did you say? Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but more more generally poo. But we'll we'll get onto that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, right. All good. Okay. Um, Alison says, I have a lot of chickweed in my garden and I'd love to start using it. So far, I've just been using it in salads. Are, are there any other ways I can cook with it? I, I don't even know what chickweed is, Jack. Yeah, chickweed is great. Super. Uh, it's really good for you. What I always find as well, um, and I think we're going to get to it in future times, um, the more studying we do towards like herbalism and and, and identifying weeds uh, in this country, because we have a lot of food that's just growing wild. Um, chickweed, it, it kind of, it, it spreads everywhere. It's quite a dainty little plant, but it kind of gets everywhere in the garden. Um, it's great on salads, but it's like really, uh, it's really nutritious as well. Um, what does it look I, like? Like, how do I spot it? Hard to, it's hard like a to bit describe like oregano, it. isn't it? Where, yeah, like that same kind oregano. of same kind of leaf. It's like a small leaf has a really pretty like uh, white flower on it as well. But it does it creeps, and you can kind of pick it up, and you'll find the end bit. But you just pick it up like a big mat. It, it's hard to describe, but it just people can Google it and find it. You you'll find it in your garden definitely. Um, but I always look around the garden, as I said about permaculture, where you observe your your place and you're identifying things all the time. Um, I always find that this stuff growing outside the farm that's actually more nutritious than the stuff I'm growing on the farm. So a lot of weeds, like, look, me and Mitch are quite uh, keen foragers as well. And I, I think there's a lot of free medicine if we just look around, um, a lot of stuff that's really high in nutrition and we need to start harnessing it a little bit more. Um, but I'm really glad um, she's putting it in salads because that's a great, great way of getting it into your diet. Mitch, you go out chickweed foraging with Jack. We do. We go out mushroom foraging quite a bit. Nice. And uh, what do you do? What, what do you do with chickweed? You said salads. Uh, well, I think salads are a little bit um, healthy. Um, so, <laughs> Amen. Well, tell me how you fry it. That's all I want to know. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to say. Uh, <laughs> I would make a tempura batter, sort of get your chickweed, roll it up into a ball, dip it in your tempura batter, deep fry it, and then maybe make sort of a, a horseradish mayo to dip it in. So we're going down the, the Japanese route, but keeping it really English at the same time. That's awesome. So, so rather than wasabi, we use horseradish and yeah. yeah. I feel like on this podcast, we should have a bell. I get to ring every time someone mentions frying. <laughs> Piers, have you, have you done things with chickweed? Yes, I would recommend having a go at making your own chickweed pesto. Mm. So basically, you use it in the same way that you would with, with basil. So make your pesto with your garlic and your pine nuts, although you can also use walnuts or cashews in fact walnuts are pretty good because of course we can we can easily grow them in this, this country so if you've grown your own walnuts picked your own chickweed we're off and running with proper homegrown produce here so yeah use your oil a bit of nooch of course whiz it all up and um you've got some great foraged pesto fantastic what kind of flavor does it have it's it it you know it's pretty nondescript. It's not strong in the same way that basil is. Yeah, and 
So you can use it in so many different dishes. You know, just bear in mind that it cooks really quickly because the leaves are very thin. So you can you can use it stir fry salads. You can drip it over a pizza. You can just fry it up with onions as a side dish. There's so many different ways of treating it. Awesome. Piers has jogged my memory uh, there as well. There's another great pesto um, dish, uh, Sticky Willy. Do you know uh, the plant where you throw it and it and it attaches? Do you remember at school you used to throw a yeah, plant? Yeah, with the little that has the little bobbles as well. Is that the yeah, one? It is the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that, it, I made a great pesto out of that last year. Wow. And again, it's like nondescriptive. Yeah. So healthy for you. It cleans like... Um, I think it cleans like metal, heavy metals out of water or something, something like that. So, someone come to the farm and he was just grabbing loads of it and was like, oh, we're going to make some pesto. And he gave a little bit of explanation. But again, something that we just walk past or we yeah. throw, it, you throw it, your mates. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. And of course, great. it uh, really clings to your spaghetti too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> people just uh, soak Sticky Willy in bottle of water and then just drink that water. As you said, it does yeah, the same thing definitely. of detoxing and cleaning you out. No way. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to go and get my hands on some sticky willy lacer on. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Natasha says, I'd love to have a permaculture garden. Could I please have the basic principles of growing food in this way? Well, sure. Uh, you, we got the right people for that. Jack, let's start with you. Well, wow, yeah. Permaculture is like a beautiful way of living it's just a holistic way of living with the land so you just got to realize that you are a part of that ecosystem the same as the bee so instead of it being like a pyramid and you're at the top you just work with it um so you just want to be planting like a lot more uh flowers so these certain beneficial flowers and you want to bring in the good insects that actually eat the bad insects that are damaging like veg plants so it's just having that uh, ecosystem balance which yeah. is super important um and it, there's so many beautiful things with permaculture like um you can grow like there's a system like the three sisters in a garden where you can grow like corn beans um and like a squash or courgette or whatever and what that does is they all feed each other like the beans wrap around the corn as it's growing so it's using its using the corn as like a pole, but also the uh, nitrogen from the beans feed the corn, feed the squash courgette. And it, and it no. just makes everything green. It, it's an old practice, but it's just like a basic one off the top of my head. But just a, another one as well, um, as we're going into talking about interplanting, is really basic one, which everyone knows in growing as well as like growing like basil with your tomatoes and like the smell of the basil deters um deters a pest that eats the tomato but has that symbiotic relationship in the garden but that symbiotic relationship goes onto a plate so if it grows well together it tends to taste well together um so it's just yeah that that is really mind-blowing stuff but that is quite mind-blowing super basic um there's so, like if you get into permaculture i think there's quite a lot of different ways people talk about it but the simplicity of it is beautiful and we can actually change the world with permaculture we can design cities around it um it goes into like how we could be living off grid um I'll, I'll give you an example of something as well um when i was in costa rica we had like a uh, we was catching all the water on tanks up on the hill and then the pipe went down and coiled within a compost heap and compost heap as it breaks down creates lots of energy lots of heat and then that pipe went to the showers albeit we was having hot showers through the magic of like hot compost heating the water see i for this year for the first time my compost got hot and it was the <laughs> most wildly exciting moment ever and like you say it's like can't we harness that it seems mad not to like, you can generate heat completely organically in a positive regenerative way uh, why would you not build that into systems for living that's pretty and i love your t-shirt uh by the way jack which just says compost i love that <laughs> um pierce uh how, how would how would you embrace this kind of permaculture culture well, as Jack Mesh has, has just mentioned, one of the things about permaculture is to do things efficiently and to try and reduce your 
workload. And one of the ways we do this with permaculture is using the idea of zones. So you start with yourself, you are zone zero, zero, then zone zero is your house. Zone one is the area outside your back door that's really close to your house. Zone two uh, is further It's literally down the like, a, like a travel card continues. in London. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So um, all the things that you will need on a regular basis from your garden, like your sleds and herbs like that, you would tend to put that in zone one. So outside your your back door, so that if, if you're cooking something and you suddenly think, oh, I need some sage, you can just nip out, pick a few leaves and you're back in again. Um, one of the things I found also is that if you're growing things in pots, then of course you can move them from zone to zone. And the example I was thinking of this year was, I always grow tumbling tom tomatoes, which are those tiny little tomatoes. They're, they're about the size of a, a pea. Absolutely delicious, brilliant for um, stir fries and pasta dishes. And uh, you can grow them in pots, even in hanging baskets. But if you know, when you start them off as seeds, we always start tomato seeds early in the year. So maybe sowing them in February or March. Too cold outside. So you have to do it in a conservatory or a greenhouse or something like that. So if we're starting them off inside, we're starting them in zone zero. And once the plants have started growing and the weather improves, then you can move them out to zone two further down the garden because you don't need to pay them much attention until they start fruiting, which they'll do in the summer. And then you can bring the pots back to zone one and <laughs> your back door. So as soon as you want a handful of tiny tomatoes, dip out, grab it in the pasta, off you go. Nice. I love the zoning. And Mitch, I wanted to talk to you a bit about um, the whole no dig thing as well because i've 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 seen some stuff online and it's extraordinary this that you, well take us through the the idea behind it yeah i think no dig is well it's a regenerative and it's an organic way to gardening and i think it's the bare minimum we should be doing as gardeners for the environment i'm all about um, bare minimums <laughs> um well so some of the principles that I use uh, with the no dig is is it's to allow the soil microbes to, to do their job in harmony. And by not disturbing the soil, we allow them, the mycorrhizal fungi, to break down all of the organic matter and feed our plant roots. Um, but so some of the things I use permaculture wise is companion planting. So marigolds next to tomatoes because the marigolds uh, release... Uh, chemicals which deter whitefly and also attract bumblebees and when bumblebees pollinate tomato flowers uh it's called buzz pollination and this no way. Buzz poll <laughs> yeah so honeybees don't actually pollinate tomatoes it's bumblebees that do through the because bumblebees have developed this way of buzzing and that this vibration uh pollinates the flower in a certain way and that um gives you greater yields with your tomatoes and your tomatoes have a higher vitamin C content. Good Lord. That's amazing. Yeah. It blows my mind thinking about that. Yeah. That's great. So the no dig thing that, so the idea is that soil has its own kind of ecosystem and that by yes. digging it up, you're actually wreaking havoc within it. Yes. Yeah, right? Much like our, our stomach has its own microbiome. Um, so, you just want it to, to, to work in harmony. And by feeding on top of the soil level, we're recreating nature. Mm -hmm. So when the forest in deciduous forest, did, uh, all the leaves drop or the pine needles drop and the, the soil networks break it all down and feed our plant, plant roots. Um, and I think soil or plant feeding is more about biology, like the dropping of leaves on the trees then it is chemistry feeding our plants bottled nutrients and fertilizers. Brilliant. Um, I think it's time to kind of, because you, you're talking about spreading stuff on top of the soil and I, I, I'm, I'm going to jump in now. This is, this is your last warning. Put, 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 put your baba ganoush down. Um, Dave says, is it vegan to use manure 
I would like to get the panel's take on this. At the end of the day, we're talking about fecal matter left by animals. Plus, naturally, our soil and land needs this for biodiversity. However, I'm vegan. And if I'm wrong on this and there's a greener way to do so, I'd love to know, as manure is still technically an animal product. Uh, Piers, let's start with you. Yeah, well, of course, a definition of a vegan is somebody who doesn't use animal products. So right from the start, we could say, yes, it's not vegan to use animal manure, particularly livestock manure. So if you think about it, and, and most commonly horse manure is sold to vegetable gardeners, or it's from stables or from a farm or wherever. And it can contain things that you don't want in your soil. So, for example, if the animal has been given antibiotics, it may also have other medicines in its in its body. It may have parasites, it may have pathogens. And all of these, if you're having tons of this onto your soil, all of this can be transferred into the soil and then into the plants that you grow. So you can be eating antibiotics that were designed for a wow. horse in, in your pumpkin, which of course you don't want. And of course there'll be tiny amounts, but you don't know what it's doing to your body and it, it can all mount up and, and react with other things in your body. So that's, that's the starting point. And um, it's, uh, you can understand why people say, well, it's a waste product. Why, why can't you just use it? But also it's adding value to the livestock industry. So if, if they're buying something else, for example, if you're buying fish and bone to put in your soil, which is a very common thing used by, by um, gardeners, then you're adding value to the livestock industry and the slaughter industry. And, and that's another thing as vegans that we don't want to do. Great answer. Um, Jack, do you use manure? Uh, first year I, I did, um, but then lo like <coughs> what, what happened was I, what, exactly what Pierce said, uh, you, you bring in something to your plot that you're unsure of it. Mine was like horses from, from stables. Um, but then, uh, there's a, there's a product now that, uh, like farmers misuse, uh, called amino pyrolid. Um, so if this is in, so what it does, it creates fields as green it gets rid of all like the broadleaf um weeds so there's more grass for them to eat it's, it's meant to be used for sheep mainly um but this uh kills like it just wrecks havoc with your soil once it's in there um stuff like tomatoes beans potatoes like they would grow and they'll be all spindly um but and it, it's just like one part per per million or per billion and it can affect your soil um so yeah i i don't use it anymore um because you don't know what you're bringing in um but i'm not against if people like so for example like an animal sanctuary or like when it, in the wild then it, it cows are great biodigesters they're creating good soil which which comes out of the butt but yeah <laughs> it, it, in terms of like it's really easy to make like a veganic compost and it's just like just more leaves wood chip grass uh, so it's like plant, like a plant-based uh, soil, which I just make now. Um, mm. But in terms of like grand scheme of things, if there's like animals wild and they're they're pumping great manure out there, but I see it as like perfect biodigesters, and then that's going back into the soil because it it does. Uh, you can grow great uh, healthy plants in it, but it's just there's so much crap in it now from these industries, and I the just irony. Don't yeah, I just don't, <laughs> I just don't agree. I don't agree with like supporting something that um, is just negative in all connotations. So like the dairy industry or anything like that. And, they, and Piers was right. What, what goes into the animals ultimately comes out. And I, I, I'm quite, I'm quite spiritual. I believe in energy as well. So there's a lot of bad energy in that um, soil as well. Um, but it, it's just, if it was my own cows, uh, I would use it, yeah. uh, but that, that's just my view on it because I don't see any problem with that. But it's just um, when you yeah. don't know where it's coming from, then, yeah, you stay away. Um, you know, 
I'm so coming on to using your own in a minute, but um, <laughs> uh, you mentioned animal sanctuaries and we mentioned pumpkins earlier. And I'm, I've seen a few animal sanctuaries online who like are really grateful for pumpkin donations at this time of year. Apparently the pigs go crazy for them. So um, I'm just I'm just saying maybe for next year. Mitch, um, what do you what do you spread when you're spreading? Uh, well, I actually do use uh, manure, but the manure I use is from our own horses so i know exactly what's going in all of their diet is completely organic i know which horses are what drugs they've had and if they have we don't use their manure and i know exactly the origin but like jack said about the amino pyrolid that stuff is deadly and not only does it affect your plants it goes into the <clears throat> protein and then it goes back down into your soil and the whole system starts again so once you've got it in your in your ground it's just absolutely impossible to get rid of so um i would yeah. stay clear of manure if you don't know where it's come from wow okay those are great answers i want to go further and i want to go deeper so one of the arguments that i've seen coming up more and more particularly in the last year is the sort of so-called mild reasonable arguments for actually a little bit of meat actually a little bit more sustainable than a vegan diet uh, actually uh in this actually in this country if you actually look at it okay we graze animals and actually um we couldn't grow any other crops on that land and actually uh we need them to replenish the soil and actually uh where are we going to actually get all of our replenishment from and i i really hate these articles because i think i mean ironically i think it's bull manure so um <laughs> but here's Here's where I'm going with this. We talk about animal manure, and obviously we have far too many animals on the planet. I think it's something like, is it 4% of the animals on the planet are wild? Um, and, uh, and actually, we talk about soil depletion. And so there's always this argument that, well, we need more animals, we need more manure, we need to replenish the soil. I'm like, well, who's doing most of the consumption and whose waste product should we really be looking at harnessing isn't it ours because we just throw that stuff away right i mean you know we eat our food and then it goes down the loo and all of that we we literally throw away and i feel like should we and i this this whole thought kind of led me to some really interesting google search results but um vegan poo like is it compostable should we be using it more are we using it um jack you've got compost written on your t-shirt i'm gonna start with you yeah there is a really good book called humanure um uh, really interesting there's a lot of like i'm, I'm literally of, gonna write that down yeah, I'm writing so, that yeah down. Uh, you see you seem <laughs> invested in this so. i'm <laughs> really invested in this yeah it's called human it's re really interesting book um but it, to be honest i well I, we, i've been to like places like people's gardens or allotments and they always have like compost toilets which, yeah. which are great yeah we can we can harness it um but i always feel like you've got to have a quite a clean diet as well right. to to use that because That's ultimately what I'm saying, what, the vegans man the vegans well you can have you could be on a diet of oreos can you and be a vegan <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so and i, I guess, am yeah <laughs> i think it, it it's more to if people like uh probably not drinking like alcohol and it, just more of like a plant-based um like plant whole foods diet sure. then yes yeah, it's, per it's perfect really it's, it is good um I know I'm only saying that only through experience from working with a farmer when I was abroad and they'd done studies and they were saying that uh, like if people are on poor, poorer diets, then it's actually, it can be quite toxic to use. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I mean, I, there are issues with like pathogens and, and, and stuff. I, I know. Uh, heavy metals as well in poo, just from really poor quality food. Um, so it can actually be detrimental um and that's from like a soil scientist that 
uh, used to work with. Um, but yeah, it's just uh, I, another thing as well. I used to work at Thames Water when I was electrician pre-farming days. And I know that they were actually uh, looking at turning it into soil as well. And the weird, uh, quite a funny thing as well, when I, I was into gardening while I was I had like an allotment at the time, but I was just noticing plants everywhere at this uh, sewage plant. Right. And then I was like, oh my God, there's tomatoes everywhere here. There was tomatoes. <laughs> so what we pass it through and then the uh -huh. seeds are still there, but there yeah, was, I'm not perfect joking, grow there was, back. Yeah. There, there was, there was tomato <laughs> seeds everywhere and the plants were like so big. And I was like, yeah. well, it's cause we don't process them. We just pull them out. Sure quite funny though i mean i i once i was once taken on a tour of eschholt sewage works in yorkshire and it was honestly the most fascinating afternoon of my life and i saw and, and I, I i have warned everybody so but he, they showed me this special skip so all the water comes in like this is from washing machines loos, showers everything it all comes in through one pipe um and there's grit um you know you like it gets caught in like the turn-ups of your shoes uh, your trousers rather or whatever when you go through the laundry and so they have to constantly dredge the sort of main reception tank when the water first comes in to get rid of this grit and it all goes into a skip but the skip 50%, I swear to God, 50% of the content of that skip were perfect, unsullied, perfectly formed, intact kernels of sweet corn. <laughs> I'm just saying you could rinse it off and put it back in the can. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I offer, but the guy said no. But um, oh. I mean, I know people are sort of exper experimenting with it. I know there are composting toilets. Um, Mitch, are you squeamish about this or, you know, do you embrace it? Have you experimented? I embrace it. Um, I've been to two farms now that have compost toilets. Um, a guy called Chris uh, from Fanfield Farm that Jack runs a podcast with and Charles Dowding. Both yes the guys. no dig guy yeah he's the guy no i've seen dig. on youtube yeah yeah he's like my biggest inspiration he's amazing um, yeah yeah and he has a compost toilet and it makes so much sense you have one section for wee one section for poo and the wee goes into the main compost and the and the poo goes into its own after two years he spreads it under his orchard and fruit trees and flower beds and we definitely should be harnessing this waste product yeah but like Jack said, it's all about having a whole food diet. I, yeah. I believe that my diet would be fine. There's no meat in there. There's no fish. There's no yeah. dairy. Um, but I think you what you're really saying is you want to be eating a carnivores. Yeah. We vegans, yeah. it's solid gold what we're making. We should be charging quite the premium. Um, Piers, have you <laughs> done any experimentation with this? For me, it's a it's a daily matter. Yes, <laughs> and, <laughs> good for you. You've actually re reminded me mentioning gold. That there's actually a really good book about dealing with urine, which is called Liquid Gold. So that's okay. Yeah. That's another one worth checking out. But, um, I'm going to write that one down back too. Back to poo, as, as we <laughs> back to so, poo. Yeah, <laughs> I I like the idea of embracing a closed loop system yes. by which we mean you, you don't bring things in and you don't throw things away so that everything is self-sufficient and you know of course if everybody was able to survive that way we wouldn't have any planetary pro problems at all but in terms of of poo and urine as well is our natural resources which we just throw away on a daily basis yeah. it's the same as people who fill their potatoes and have have all this kitchen waste and then just chuck it in the bin. or even if you send it off to a um you know kitchen waste reusing scheme you're still basically throwing away nutrients which you should be putting on your compost heap to keep the nutrients within your system and then spread on your soil so it's, it's the same with poo ideally we would each have our own compost toilet and um usually they have two two chambers so that one of them is breaking down naturally while you're refilling the next one <laughs> yeah. it, it, it can take a long time so it can take a whole year 
for it all to break down. This is a mixture of poo and the sawdust and whatever else you, that, that you've, you've, you've put in there, etc. et cetera. Sure. And, uh, Maybe some will, croutons. Will very slowly. <laughs> sweet corn, tomato seeds, sure. the whole lot. It's <laughs> all in the mix. And, um, break it all down over, over about a year. And then, as, as the other guys have said, you can, you can spread it around your fruit trees and other things like that. But, yeah, throwing away our naturally produced nutrients is is criminal really thank you all of you for making me feel like i'm maybe not mad i appreciate that <laughs> i look forward to seeing your amazon wish list <laughs> <laughs> um yeah sure i mean yeah I, I mean i've got a list of like the top 10 people i'd i'd want it from <laughs> yeah you won't anyway. need sweet corn seeds now no i know i won't <laughs> Um, brilliant. Uh, let's, uh, Andy's got a question. He says, hi, Jake. Uh, can I have some pest control tips, please? I've tried to grow sweet corn twice and both times the badgers have eaten it all. Wow. I mean, how awesome to have badgers in your garden. Although I'm not angry at the badgers as they've seen foolish me basically laying it on a plate for them, <laughs> but I would ideally like it to be my lunch and not theirs. Help me please. Wow. Are there any natural badger repellent plants? Piers, I see you nodding. Well, the problem with badgers, of course, is that they are big, strong animals. So it's quite difficult to keep them out of a garden. Not, not that a lot of people would want to because they're beautiful things to observe. But if you want to keep them off your veg plot, one possibility is fencing. The disadvantage is because they're so big and strong is you need some pretty heavy duty fencing. And Buckingham Palace. Go, yeah, yeah, it will have to go underground as well, because, of course, they can burrow down and dig underneath it. So that is quite a big undertaking, um, unless it's a, it's a really serious problem and they're, they're they're just decimating your veg plot. But there are things that you can use that will repel them. And badgers generally, they have little pathways and tunnels, so they will have specific places where they get into your garden. So it might be a hole in a hedge, for example, where you see they've made a little trackway. So you can start by putting repellents there. And the, the ones that spring to mind are citronella, um scotch bonnet chilies which ah. you can chop up place around but this ties in with the other things we've been talking about male human urine is a good deterrent because right. it makes the badgers think that it's some other animal's territory so uh andy yeah. just get out in your plot. Yeah. Pro probably in the dark you know with a head torch <laughs> morning just go around morning. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and just go around your your boundary, especially the places that you know where the badgers come in, and just wee away your troubles. <laughs> <laughs> Does it work, Jack? Have you tried that? Yeah, I had it last year. I don't know whether it was badgers. It looked like badgers because they they burrowed. They're looking for like worms and stuff. Um, I couldn't tell whether it was badgers or foxes, but I done exact exactly what Piers said. I kind of like blocked off areas where I thought they were coming in and out um and on google it said try and get lion's poo i was like oh yeah great i'll just sure, go to yeah, yeah, london yeah. zoo <laughs> pick up some lion's poo but um yeah urine that, exactly what pierce said that the, the hormones in that they're thinking oh it's a bigger predator than me so i'm just going to leave it alone and it and it worked yeah um but I be the lion mine was like a quarter of an acre so i had to drink a <laughs> <lot>. <laughs> yeah. mitch uh how do you uh deter people i mean it works for nightclubs as well i think <laughs> yeah i haven't got any badger problems thankfully I, my biggest pest is birds uh, mm. and mice yeah well, what uh, do you do I'm, with those i'm just leaving them be to be honest with you yeah yeah there's um there's not really much i can do yeah I'm just eating the tops of me carrots yeah well i guess you can spare a nibble can't you um andy good luck and most of all, good luck to your neighbours. Um, last question. Maria says, um, I've been growing chilli plants for the last two years and it's been a huge success. I've got Scotch bonnet chilies ready to be picked. I know this may sound silly, uh, but because I've grown them myself, I don't want to use them in any old dinner. So I'd love some ideas on what ways I can use my Scotch bonnets. Well, they make great ornaments around badger runs. Um, 
What would you do? Well, Mitch, let's start with you. What would you do with Scotch bonnets? How would you celebrate them? Obvious choice would be to make a jerk sauce, I would imagine. It's the best way to celebrate the Scotch bonnet. Um, yeah. So I like to make mine with some freshly grated nutmeg, lime juice, dark brown sugar, uh, cinnamon powder, Scotch bonnet, garlic, ginger. You need some dark rum in there as well. Oh, yeah. That sounds great. And you just blend it, right? Blend it all together and then just, yeah, whatever veggies you've got in the garden, even maybe get some tempeh or some tofu, marinate it and grill it. Yeah. I mean, tofu, not, not tempeh. Let's, let's not go crazy here. I'm sorry. I, I have a very bad attitude to tempeh. Uh, I, I, you should have been briefed on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jack, what do you like to do with Scotch bonnets? Um, yeah, I grew, I grew them uh, last two years, uh, Jamaican scotch bonnets, and I've got a really uh, favoured like chilli sauce recipe, um, and then I just added them in. So it's uh, Jamie Oliver's got one with like uh, tomatoes and chilies, and the thing, the secret bit in that is the apple sauce. It just kind of like has a nice relationship. Really great sauce, but then I had like that was my medium one, and then the scotch bonnet one was the hot one. So I just chucked in scotch bonnets in that and and yeah just leveled it up a little bit i just think it's um it's one of those plants i mean hats off to growing something like that because in terms of like growing ease it's at the top of like something that's going to take ages to grow and you've got to look after it properly and um yeah but but the rewards is if you love hot sauce and stuff is you're going to have your own hot sauce and there's nothing more pleasurable than having your own food i think totally piers do you do things with scotch bonnets? I do. Well, I hate to mention a sauce again. Of course, all vegans love sriracha sauce. And uh, I make a version which uh, is a bit different from the other sauces mentioned. And you can bottle it and store it for a long time. I call it a spitfire sauce. Although one reviewer once said, you won't just be spitting fire. Oh dear. Anyways. <laughs> and saying. we're back. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is connected in. Of veganic course it is. Growth. It's yes. the circle. Yeah. Yeah. So you start off by taking a whole bunch of your Scotch bonnets, maybe 30, 40, whatever. Use a knife and fork to cut them in chunks and to get rid of the seeds. Cause you don't want the seeds in this particular sauce. Put the flesh of the chilies in a pan with a chopped up capsicum pepper, like a green pepper or red pepper, something like that. Um, and you add a spoon of salt, spoon of sugar, and then you top it up with a with about a cupful of vinegar. Just cider vinegar is fine, or or even just the just the normal plain white distilling vinegar. Bring it to the boil for 30 minutes, and then you blend it either in a food processor or with a stick blender. And you've got this really beautiful, bright red hot sauce and you can bottle it in sterilized bottles and that will, will keep for months. Once you've opened it like a normal sauce, put it in the fridge and use it within a few months. But the bottle stuff sealed will, will keep forever. And of course, if you're doing it in fairly smallish bottles, these make great christmas presents as well because christmas is on the way people <clears throat> no it's not everything's fine um <laughs> i gents thank you for a, a really uh, illuminating uh and uplifting listen i really appreciate it and particularly with all the difficulties we had recording it uh thank you for sticking with it um before you go where can people find you and the stuff you do mitch let's start with you um mainly on instagram my it's at mitch underscore grows and you can also check out where i'm starting my film project which is at pomona spelled p-o-m-o-n-a perfect and jack uh at jack's patch uh, so jack's underscore patch on instagram mainly um but i also have like a food growing uh podcast um so we just talked to local growers from like the uk but around the world and it'll be like whether it's uh a lot of material rooftop farming mushrooms microgreens we're trying to cover all bases to get you into growing whatever path you want to take um we've i've had mitch on as well um what's that podcast yeah, just, called uh the food grower podcast or food grower academy we've got an academy so um yeah just find it on all your favorite platforms and yeah, yeah tune in wherever you are right now. Uh, Piers, what about you? 
easiest just to start off with my main website, which is quite simply peerswarren.co.uk. And there will be links to my other social networks, etc. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Um, before we go, I feel, I feel like this is this this felt right to do now, um, and uh, I don't think I'm going to get another opportunity. In fact, I, I I don't even know if we'll ever do another podcast again after the filth uh, we've discussed <laughs> in this. Um, but uh, I, you know, in my other guise, I'm a comedian, and I specialize in, in in reducing TV shows and films and things down to sort of ninety second versions. So here is Gardener's World in ninety seconds. Ah, it's time for the pre-titles bit and here's me walking through my garden on the Cockney one, talking quietly, smiling like I'm at my grands. Ah, look at these daisies here. Ah, oh, you've been cheeky, ain't you? Huh. Anyway, I'm not on this week, it's Monty Don. Too many broken hearts in the world, there's too many hearts have been broken into. Hello, I'm Monty Don. I've got a lovely garden, a lovely dog, and lovely clothes, like a French painter's. It'd be rather lovely, wouldn't it, to spend a lovely afternoon with me, perhaps having a lovely picnic, a lovely bottle of wine, some lovely tomatoes from my garden. And then I could gently slide in my love, nice and smooth, <clears throat> there. Someone else who's not as smooth as me is the one who looks like the bloke who does Lenny Beige, Joe Swift. He's been looking at a futuristic garden in Switzerland or something, I expect. This is absolutely fantastic garden. I love the flower beds made out of AAA batteries and these amazing flowers made out of tinfoil and real space age touch. Rachel DeLovely has been pretending to be interested in an expert on bull weevils, although I think she might secretly be interested in me and my love. Uh, but also this week, Carol Klein's been somewhere because I'm not doing it. I haven't left this garden in eight years now, apart from Radio Times Christmas parties. So she's gone to Scotland or Devon or something like that. For me, there's no plant that compares with whatever plant it is we're covering this week. And this is it. Madeoponium pretentiensis. Let me now talk to some sexless wonder who's devoted his entire adult life to growing this glorious plant and also trying to clear his CRB. And is it just me, but if you met me at a party, do you think I'd probably slosh my wine about and laugh a bit too long if I was talking to you? But mutely, like this... <laughs> Next week, my favourite plant again. Thanks, Ros. I know her name's Carol, but she looks like a Ros, doesn't she? Here are some jobs that you can be getting on with this weekend. Now's a great time to be pooing on your rhubarb, and it's something you can get the whole family to do, even the silly old dog. Just remember, if you eat the rhubarb, you'll probably go blind. <coughs> Oops. Too late. Bye-bye. Too many hearts have been broken in tears. Too many hearts have been broken into. I'm really sorry. Thanks for your indulgence. Um, that's it from the podcast for this week. Uh, you can email all your complaints to uh, podcast at veganlifemag.com. Veganlifemag.com is where you can buy a subscription to the magazine or you can go to a shop and, you know, meet people and stuff and get out there in the world and socialise. It'd be really great. Um, there's an app too. Also, you can join us on Instagram. It's uh, vegan life underscore podcast. There, I got it right. Um, in the meantime, I'm, I'm Jake Yap, and I'm really sorry. Um, we'll just do a normal podcast next time. Lots of love. Take care. Bye-bye. This has been a Swanburst Media production. <laughs> <laughs>